Thank you. Good morning. Our reading today is from Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 18. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been, been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let us not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lord looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zoh. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lord chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lord lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lord had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring will be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Second reading, Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So I think uh, there's uh, this. Uh, children ages, uh, oh. right? Okay. <laughs> so we don't know how to do this, so you have to bear with us. Uh, so children ages 4 to 4th grade are dismissed for children's church. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have asked Rose to pray. For us as we um, go into the word. Most holy God, we come before you. We ask that you quiet our spirits, quiet our minds, that we will hear you speak to us. Thank you for the gift of teaching your word. Pray for Bulos who is preaching this morning that God, you will give him the right words and a message for each one as we are represented here. Thank you for your presence will be with him. We ask this with thanksgiving. 
through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't need that. I think. I think. Uh, somebody somewhere. Uh, so, <laughs> so we are new at uh, this. Um, do you thank you for reading the scripture and for praying for me? Good morning, West Shore Baptist. How are you? Good this is an exciting day. Christ is risen. Yes. Amen. That's the right response. Yeah. Last week was Easter. That is true. But today is uh, Easter in the Orthodox tradition. In fact, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the disciples had the audacity to change worship, Sabbath worship, to Sunday worship. Now, if that isn't audacious, I mean, nothing else is. And we get to celebrate that every Sunday. Today, next Sunday, every Sunday, is Resurrection Sunday. Because Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, you also would live with him. Hallelujah. I am grateful to God for his grace upon my life and the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. I thank you all for your kindness and gracious words. I mean, I have received that so many times. I'm indeed uh, grateful. I also thank Pastor Kelly and the search committee for their kindness throughout uh, this whole process. Finally, I am incredibly grateful to God for the support of my wife, Rose, and our seven children. All of them are here except for two sons. Uh, so two of our sons are not here. Tim isn't here because they are moving, and uh, our two isn't here. And our six grandchildren are also here. I'm actually delighted all of them are here. So I'm a happy man. Uh, thank you all for your love and kindness, not only today, but always. I love you all. Our passage this morning is about choices and their consequences. So bear with me. Uh, I'll uh, fumble through some things because of this thing. So... Um, but uh, we'll figure this out, hopefully, before the end of the message. If not, uh, probably sometime, uh, I'll figure it out. So probably no country in the world is confronted with as many choices as we are here in the U.S. Every day we have opportunity to make choices and decisions, like whether to come to church this morning or not the brand of detergent to buy. And uh, eating cereal in the morning is actually like a mini United Nations, uh, at least for me. What to order in a restaurant, what job to take, what neighborhood to live in, whether to speak to your relative or not, what to do with Jesus. As you can see, some of these decisions are weightier than others. Where am I supposed to point? Okay, I, I am not trusting what, uh, but anyway, it's working. Okay. Our passage this morning, Genesis 13, is the story of two ordinary men, just like us, who loved their families and were facing challenge in life and had to make decisions. Their choices revealed who they were. And it shaped their future. When we read the story of Abraham today, so pardon me, I'll be saying Abraham instead of Abraham because his name hadn't changed at this time, but it's the same person, so I'm not saying a different person. So when we read the story of Abraham today, it is colored by the fact that we call him the father of our faith. We see in him the hero of the story. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all revere him as a prophet. However, we need to remember in Genesis 13, he had not yet earned that title. He was like any of us. Abraham's call by God 
was in chapter 12 at the age of 75. So if you have your Bible, you can just flip back. You see actually what's happening. Abraham had been working with God just 10 years when a famine hit the land. So he went to Egypt to save his family. While there, in order to save his life, he told a lie that his wife was his sister. God saved him. He told the same lie again in Genesis 20. God delivered him. His son Isaac told the same lie in Genesis chapter 26. So it looks like they had something going on in their family with that. All of this to say Abraham was not a perfect man, but an ordinary man, just like us sitting here. In fact, at this point in his life, many of us have been walking with Jesus longer than Abraham had. So give the guy a break. Also in this passage, we read that Abraham and Lot, his nephew, moved their tents from Canaan to Egypt and then back to Canaan. When God called Abraham in chapter 12, he built an altar to the Lord between Bethel and Ai. That's uh, Genesis 12, 8. However, this journey of faith was interrupted by this famine. And he abandoned it and went to Egypt in search of greener pastures. So it was to this location that Abraham uh, returned when he returned from Egypt. And when he returned this time, he prayed. And that's what it says in verse 4. He worshipped God. Most scholars say that Abraham's going to Egypt was a failure to trust God. He should have trusted God and remained in Canaan, even during the famine. But anyway, he didn't. So all of this to say Abraham is just like us. So he had his missteps also. At this time, I wanted to also point out to you that they lived in tents, it says. Tents underscore an important truth about life. Tents are not permanent. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were asked to celebrate a festival called the Festival of Tents, Feast of Tabernacles, or the Sukkot. They were to live in tents for seven days to remind them of the transitory nature of this world and their lives. We are all tent dwellers, all of us, myself included, we are all tent dwellers. Everything we own and our lives are temporal. In fact, Psalm 95 to 6 says, We are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. That is your life. That is my life. From these verses, verses 1 to 4, we can see that we can and we indeed do make choices about our tents. We choose what to do with it. Just like Abraham, just like Lot, we choose what to do with our tents. And indeed, we do things with our tents regularly. Even today, we do things with our tents. In verses 5 to 9, we see that though they were back to where God wanted them to be, trouble arose. We see that uh, there is trouble in life. You would think that because they were obeying God, everything would be rosy. No, that's not the way God operates. He operates on a totally different rhythm and schedule. One lesson for us here is that Followers of God are not immune to challenges of life. I'm sure many of you would say amen to that or that is true. They had just faced famine and now family feud followed just very quickly. Abraham and Lot had returned from Egypt. Wealthy men, very wealthy men. Conflict arose between them because of their wealth. They had dis. They had to decide what to do. Another thing we see is that 
the choices they had to make was public. You would think that uh, this is supposed to be a private affair. No, it's not. If you look in verse 7, it says that there were Canaanites and Perizzites also living in the same land. So it wasn't just Abraham and Lot. It was all of those people too. They were watching, these Canaanites and Perizzites were watching to see what was going on, how these two people, strangers in the land, would resolve their conflict. They saw the choices that Abram and Lot made. Fast forward 52 years later, when Sarah died, and Abraham wanted to buy a land to bury her. It says the people respected Abraham. Let me read a little bit of that to you because it's a beautiful story. It says, Sarah had lived to be 127 years old when she died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for her and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell some of some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to, replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you this tomb for burying your dead. How about that as a testimony and a witness for this man? They had watched his life for 52 years. And this was the conclusion they came to when he asked for a place to bury his wife. They called him a prince amongst them. So their choice. Abraham's choice and choices all along for 52 years was noticed by these people. The choice that Lot made also was known to them. We'll talk about his choice in a bit. Verses 8 and 9 tell us about Abraham's suggestion on how to resolve this conflict between them. It reveals the condition of Abraham's heart. He wanted a peaceful resolution because he said they were family. They were family. He says, we are brothers. In fact, the same word that Abraham used is the word that is used during the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. Again, that's a beautiful passage. But James stood up and said, brethren, he addressed the people there, the Christians, the believers there, and said, this is how we need to resolve this issue over a conflict that arose in Antioch. Uh, that's uh, another passage. I'm sorry I don't have that to project for you, but you have to take my word for it. <laughs> this passage, this word rather, brothers, is filled with love and empathy. It's a word that you don't use lightly. And that's why you can see what Abraham suggested. No wonder Abraham offered Lot the first pick. He did not think of himself higher than he ought to. He humbled himself. His solution indeed was Christ-like. Like Jesus in Philippians 2, 3 to 6, Abraham did not hold on to his power and position of privilege as elder or even the head of the family. He said, take whatever land you want. So Abraham was concerned about Abraham, sorry, was also concerned about being a worthy ambassador for Christ or for God. You remember there were Perizzites and Canaanites in the land, so he was concerned about how they were viewing this conflict between him and uh, Lot. Every decision or choice you or I make in private, after all, is before a watching world. It is before your spouse, it's before your children, it's before your parents, 
It's before your relatives, it's before your colleagues, it's before your classmates, it's before your teammates, it's before other believers, it's also before unbelievers. Every decision is not private, it's public. Every choice or decision made in, in private reverberates in public. Are your decisions in line with your professional faith? What message is your choice or decision communicating? So we have seen that our choices are public and our choices reveal who we are. Have I advanced at all? Did it change? Okay. Is this verses 10 to 13? Yes, it is. Okay, I can see that from here. Okay, just bear with me. So in verses 10 to 13, we see that our choices have consequences for our present. Lord's choice revealed the condition of his heart, and it had consequences for his life. Here are a few things that you see about the condition of Lord's heart. First of all, Lord disregarded cultural norms. In Semitic culture, you will defer to the elder when there is an issue like this. Lot didn't do that. Now, in the African tradition, in matters like this, you would say, no, I won't go first. You do whatever you want, and I would take whatever you don't choose. That's the way at least a good African would behave. That's the way a good Nigerian would behave. Not only that, Lot disregarded familial norms. In this case, his father's well-being. Abraham was his adoptive dad. In my culture, he would call Abraham his father. Even here in the West, if your dad asks you to choose first, you will say no. Even if eventually you go first, you will not be thinking about your own interests you will be thinking about their interest. So in my message, I said my children should take notes. Uh, <laughs> Lot disregarded human kindness. In verse 11 in this passage, it says, Lot chose for himself the whole plain. Two key words. Chose for himself, chose the whole plain you would have think, at least think half, half. No, he chose the whole plane for himself. He was only thinking about himself, no, about the well-being of his family. Lot chose what was best for him and his family based on what his eyes saw, his perception. He must have told his family the decision he made. Even if he didn't tell them, at least they saw the decision he made on their behalf. And I'm sure they probably were congratulating him and saying, well done, Dad. I mean, this is really good. You chose well for us. Another thing, Lot disregarded the spiritual dangers. I believe that Lot knew that the people of Sodom were wicked and sinning against God. That is why if you look in the passage, it says, he pitched his tent near Sodom, not in Sodom, not in the city itself. He just went near it. He knew, why didn't he go into it? I believe it's because he knew this isn't a good place after all. Now we turn our attention to the process of Lord's choice. Why did he choose this land really? We read in verse 10, that he acted based on what he saw. That's chapter 13, verse 10. He saw from a human perspective when Abraham, was asked, him, when Abraham asked him to choose which way to go. It says, Lot lifted his eyes and made his choice based on what he saw. What he saw looked good to, its, to his eyes. It looked like the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. You can't beat that. Now, 
I was asking, where else do we see something like this in scriptures? Oh, Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, it says, when the woman, that's Eve, saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband. Now, before you think she did it somewhere and then came to, you know, it says she gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So, in a way, he was agreeing to that decision. When Adam and Eve saw the fruit from a human perspective, they neglected what God had said to them about the fruit. This is the danger of looking from a human perspective. We forget or neglect divine injunctions. The next time we hear about Lot in this vein, uh, there's chapter 14, but the next major time we hear about Lot is chapter 19. In chapter 19, he had moved, you don't have this, but chapter 19. At this time, Lot had moved into the city. And we meet him in the city gates. Now, that is important to note. This is where the elders of the city congregated, where important issues were discussed, businesses conducted, and cases decided. In fact, if you look at uh, Proverbs chapter 31, the virtuous woman, it says her husband is praised in the city gates, and her praise was even sung in the city gates herself. So to sit at the city gates meant one had attained eminence in the city. Lot had become a member of the city council. Within a few years of being there, it's not a small feat. It's a huge feat. Because Lot moved his tent near Sodom, it was not difficult. It actually made it easier for him to move his tent into Sodom. Now, don't get the impression that Lot was an evil man. No. Actually, Lot was a good man. In fact, he's referred to also as a righteous man. He's not a bad man. Now, how do we know this? Well, let me show you something in Scripture. In chapter 18, it says, uh, this is when the three visitors came to Abraham. It says, now... The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. While he was sitting in the entrance of his tent, in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried to the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed down low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, Lord, my Lord, do not pass by your servant. Let me... Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you, can get, so you can be refreshed, and then you can get on your way. Now that you have come to see your servant. Very well, they said. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. So this is how Abraham welcomed the guests. Look at the way Lot welcomed these guests. Chapter 19, he was living in the city. It says, the two angels at Sodom uh, arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city, not a tent now, he's a big man. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them, and bow down his face to the ground. My Lord, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early the next morning. No, they said, we will spend the night in the square. I mean, where did we read these words? I mean, this is the way he ended. So he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And he prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. I mean, 
that's exactly the way that Abraham behaved. So Lot and Abraham, I mean, Lot was a good man. In fact, Scripture calls him a righteous man. If that isn't convincing enough for you, hear what is said of Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse, uh, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. That's the New Living Translation. So our choices, friends, have consequences for our present. So though Lot was a good man, Lot disregarded the influence of the city on him and his family. He did not know how this new environment was going to affect him and his family. Friends, human beings don't know the future. Even righteous men don't know the future. I don't know the future. And in case you don't uh, know, you also don't know the future. <laughs> we don't know the future. But if only Lot had asked God to see things from God's perspective. You see, within a few years of being in Sodom, he was taken captive in chapter 14. Abraham rescued him. Ultimately, in less than 25 years, he had lost everything, as we see in chapter 19. Now, how do we know it's 25 years? Well, it's simple math, but... Uh, Abraham was called when he was 75, and when uh, Isaac was born, Abraham was 100. So that's 25 years, right? Now, all of this happened before Isaac was born, so it's probably within a space of 20 years. What seemed good to his eyes actually was his ruin, not only his ruin, but that of his family. What a price to pay for a land. What a price to pay. I suspect his family knew why they moved, and I would say, venture to guess, it was for material pursuit. This became part of their family values. When Abraham prayed for Lot, this is interesting also. When Abraham was praying for Lot and for Sodom, he was bargaining with God. He said, God, what if there are 25 people. What if there are 20? So he finally settled at 10. What if there were 10 righteous people in the city? He was hoping that Lot and his family would have gained six more people. Lot, his wife, their two daughters. So he was hoping there would at least be six others that they would have won to the Lord during the span of their time in Sodom. Now, if you do the math, Lot had servants. Those were the people quarreling with Abraham's uh, herdsmen, right? So at least six of them, if they had been followers of God, then Sodom would have been spared. Well, even if you don't go that route, so I had time to think about this. So preachers get opportunity to do this with the Bible, by the way. So Lot had two daughters, and we know in the story that he had sons-in-law. So if he had won two of his sons-in-law, that would have made their number to be six. And if two of their parents, father and mother, father and mother, I mean, that gives you ten right there, right? But it didn't happen. In fact, when, Abraham was, uh, when Lot was asking them to leave, they wouldn't leave. They were laughing at him and mocking him. In Genesis 19, we read that God destroyed Sodom. But not before, and the story is fascinating there, not before Lot and his family, in fact, Scripture says, were dragged out. Because in verse, chapter 19, verse 16, it says, Lot hesitated. Even Lot hesitated. But this was a good man. Started good. The decision kind of looked like okay. But this whole thing 
had become so confusing. On the way out, they didn't all make it because Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. The decision that started with what he saw in his eyes came with a colossal price tag. It cost him his wife and all his material possession. One commentary said, sensual choices are sinful choices and seldom speed well for us. Those who in choosing relations, callings, dwellings, or settlements are guided and governed by lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eye, and the pride of life, and consult not the interest of their souls and their religion, cannot expect God's presence with them, nor his blessing upon them. In all our choices, this principle should overrule us. That that is best for us is that which is best for our souls. When you make decisions, is it good for my soul? Is it good for my soul? So let me ask you, why are you choosing? What are you choosing? What values are informing and guiding your choice? Brothers and sisters, let's not trust ourselves or what we see. Scriptures say we should not lean on our own understanding. We need to see things from God's perspective. Our choices about our tent have consequences and they shape our present. Our choices about our, our tent shape not only our present but also our destiny and legacy. This chapter concludes with uh, Abraham's choice or actually God's choice for Abraham in verses 14 to 18. This is a beautiful part, I mean. Uh, so just bear with me. I will go longer. Pastor Kelly told me how, much, how long I needed to go, but you just, just be patient with me. Uh, I, can't, I can't let this passage go by because, look, our religion is religion of good news. Uh, and in this passage, there is good news. Not just about Lot, there is good news. So look at what happens. God told Abraham to look elsewhere. He was to see from God's perspective. I like that. God showed him the entire land. North, east, east, west, and south. God showed him everything. Now, notice that Lot chose one direction. Lot chose east, and that was where he went. When Abraham saw from God's perspective, God gave him everything. Now, when God gave Abraham this, he said, look at the entire land, even where Lot took. All of it I give to you. How about that? That's the way our God rolls. That's why we love him even more than that. Anyway, when Abraham saw from God's perspective, see what he did. Scripture says he moved his tent to where he built an altar to the Lord. His response was worship and intimacy with God. His confidence wasn't in what God gave him, but in the God who is the giver. Do your choices to move your tent move you closer to God? Or lead you to trust God? Or lead you to worship him? That's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. So in order to learn about Lot's choice, how it shaped his destiny, we have to finish this passage, chapter 19. And uh, this is X-rated. So if you don't know, this, this is uh, something. So this is Lot after he left, um, left Sodom. It says, uh, Lot and his two daughters left Zohar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zohar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. 
from tent to city to cave. One day, the older daughter said to the younger daughter, Our father is old and there is no man around here to give us children, as is custom all over the world. Let's get our father to drink wine and sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so that you can go in and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also and the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it. So both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites today. The younger daughter also had a son. She named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites today. That is sobering, isn't it? Remember, he is a good man, but his choice cost him a lot. He did not lose his salvation, but his choice cost him a lot. First, Sodom was attacked. His decision and consequences not only happened to him, but his wife, his children, future generation, the Moabites and the Ammonites. I mean, if they ask them, how did you come about? This is the story they tell. We need to be careful with the decisions and choices we make because it does not affect us alone. It affects the people around us. It affects your spouse. It affects your children. It affects your grandchildren. It affects your siblings. It affects your parents. It affects your friends. It affects your colleagues. It affects our society. It affects even other nations. It will affect many people you will never meet. Your great, great, great grandchildren, nieces, whoever they are. Your decisions today would affect them. Look, we are talking about the story of Abraham today. This is what we are saying because of the choices he made. This is good news. This is what scripture says. Set your hearts on things above, not on things of uh, this world. Are we there? I don't think we're there. Yeah, okay, that's it. Let this be the motivation in life for you and why you move your tent. Set your heart on things above not on things of this world. Friends, brothers, and sisters, I can tell you this enough. This is gospel for us. The world offers us so many different things, but trust me, this is the real deal. This is what we live for. This is who we are. When people talk about us, may it be that they say these are people who have set their hearts and minds on things above. Not on things of this world. It will fade. It wouldn't last. I don't know. I wish there were a way I could say this to you so that you would hear. Look, the decisions you make is going to affect your children. It's going to affect the next. But look, your decision is going to affect me as your brother in Christ. My decision is going to affect you. Our lives are intertwined. Don't this is okay. Hope I remember it. Okay. Jim Elliot, the missionary martyred by the Orca Indians in Ecuador in 1956, wrote in his journal these now famous words. He says, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose.
friends, he wrote this when he was 22 years old. Young people, younger people, note this. Six years after he wrote these words, he was martyred. Amazing. Young people, you can make decisions that shape the legacy and destiny of many people. Our decisions and choices shape our destinies and legacies. Dear brothers and sisters, we are always making decisions. We are always making choices. At times, it appears that your options are between two bad ones. In such a situation, trust God to show you what to do. Remember Abraham? He got what appeared to be a rotten deal. But see what God made out of it. If you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Seek God, especially when options are not, as, especially when the options seem clear to you, like to Lot. Don't lean on your own understanding, though. <laughs> Lot thought op the options were clear. He made his choice based on human perception. As you make your choices, remember that tents are temporal. We are all tent dwellers. Life is transitory. Nothing here is permanent. No matter how beautiful your tent is, remember it is still a tent. It is very temporal. And no matter how horrible things are in your tent, remember it is just a tent. Say to someone, it is just a tent. It is just a tent. Look, that's not the final word. It's not permanent. It's not the final word about you or your situation. Jesus said to his disciples, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come back and take you. In my father's home, there are many, many mansions there. So our tents are going to be replaced by mansions. That's the promise. So don't keep your eyes on things here. Look up there because mansions are coming for us. It's very easy for us to forget this fact when things are going well. Or when things are going wrong, it's very easy to forget. But remember, God is in control. Our choices are public. The impact of our choices reverberates in public. Our choices are our true identity. They reveal our true identity. Our choices have consequences. God's choice is the final word about you. I want to also say to you, I mean, I have this also in my life. God is able to redeem our past. Give your past to God. Look, if you are a man, you would have made a wrong choice. You remember we started with Abraham, right? Abraham made a wrong choice by going to Egypt from Canaan. If you are a man like all of us, you would have made a wrong choice, a bad choice. If there is a wrong choice you made, ask God. God desires to write the past for you. He is with you. If you repent... He's going to help you to correct whatever. He is going to correct whatever it is. There was a lady who had a family heirloom, a handkerchief actually, that had been in her family for generations. Accidentally, she got it stained and lamented because she wanted to hand this family heirloom to her children. She couldn't do that because it was now ruined. One man in her group asked her to give the handkerchief to see what he could do with it. She was skeptical because from her perspective, it was hopeless. She gave it to him because she had nothing to lose. After several weeks, he returned the, uh, the handkerchief to her. She was speechless. She was speechless. The man had created a masterpiece 
out of the ruined handkerchief. No matter how bad your situation is, give it to God. Give him your mistakes. Our God knows how to turn messes into masterpieces. May the Lord bless uh, his words to us. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We ask that uh, you would help us in our journey with you. Thank you because you give us opportunity to walk with you every day. Please help us to live our lives in honor of you. I hope you will say yes to God today in shaping your legacy and destiny. Blessings. Lord.